So I'm a bone marrow transplant physician. We see patients for cutaneous T-cell lymphoma when they're referred to us from either the dermatologist or the oncologist, like Dr. Porcu, for a possibility of transplantation. So stem cell transplantation, for those of you who don't know what it's about, is used in many hematologic diseases. And very often, it's the only curative therapy for, for these hematologic diseases. In CTCL, if you look at advanced stage disease, there's really no therapy that produces truly durable responses. And a number of studies have now looked at the use of transplantation CTL it indicates it may be very effective therapy. And I would challenge us to see that sometimes I think allogeneic transplant may be curative in some therapy. And I'll show, you, I'll show you some data on that. However, the toxicity is fairly severe in transplant. So that's always the downside of doing a transplant. The toxicity is involved in the procedure. But I do think there's some data to suggest it may be curative in some patients with CTCL who have fairly advanced disease. The types of transplant we do are an autologous transplant using the donor's own cells and an allogeneic transplant using the, using the donor cells. So if we use a patient's own cells, we do achieve a high response rate. However, this does not result in long-term remissions in CTCL patients. However, retrospective comparisons suggest that patients do better with allogeneic transplants, that is using donor stem cells. This is the outcome of patients undergoing donor stem cell transplants versus autologous transplants using their own marrow. As you can see, the ones who do allogeneic transplants do far better. So because of data like this, most centers who do transplant for CTCL do allogeneic transplants. We occasionally do an autologous transplant using the patient's own bone marrow, but in general we rely on allogeneic or donor transplants for these diseases. If you look at what a transplant's about, when a patient comes in for transplant, they enter the hospital, get a fair amount of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and the purpose of that is twofold. One is to eliminate their tumor cells, of course, to eliminate the CTCL cells, also to eliminate the patient's own immune system. As a consequence of all that chemotherapy, you're also going to destroy the patient's bone marrow, which have normal cells in it. As the patient's undergoing chemotherapy and radiation therapy, the donor is being prepared to donate the stem cells to the patient, and we call the day of donation day zero. And the donation of the donor stem cells looks like and goes in like a blood transfusion into the patient. We have several different ways of harvesting the stem cells out of the donor, but that allows us to get a good number of stem cells to go into the patient. There is about a 12-day recovery period after the actual transplant during which the donor cells start making blood and platelets and white cells that the patient will need to survive the rest of their lives. However, we need to provide some supportive care during that 12-day period to allow the patient to, to recover successfully. And it can be a very intense process to get the patient through this whole procedure. Why do we do allogeneic transplants and not autologous transplants? Well, the one thing is we're getting no marrow from a normal donor. The do donor obviously doesn't have a lymphoma, doesn't have CTCL. The donor's stem cells haven't been exposed to all the chemotherapy a patient may have been exposed to prior to harvesting their stem cells. But probably most importantly, there's a documented immunologic activity of those donor stem cells that are directed against CTCL tumor cells. The donor cells actually have a graft versus lymphoma effect, a graft versus CTCL effect that helps us clear the patient of his underlying malignancy. The disadvantage obviously is the toxicity involved in the procedure, but also somewhat finding a donor. I'm going to show you three studies looking at what the outcome is of patients undergoing transplant for CTCL. Two of these are registry studies, which means these are compilations of a lot of patients from different centers going through transplant. And I have to admit, there's a lot of bias in patient selections in patients undergoing transplant in these sort of studies. Uh, the patients are, are very heterogeneous. The procedures they're undergoing are very heterogeneous. But the outcomes and how they do with the transplant, I think, are very, very important to look at. This first study I, I, I'm showing you is our, actually the largest study of patients undergoing transplant for either uh, uh, mycosis fungoides or Cesare syndrome. It's from the CIBMTR registry. That's our US registry of collecting patient outcomes of patients undergoing transplant in the US. It was 129 patients who were transplanted between 2000 and 2009. As I mentioned, these patients receive a variety of treatments, a variety of supportive care measures to get them through the transplant. If you look at what the patients are, who, who went to transplant, uh, there are two types of transplants used, and we don't have to go into the detail. The patients uh, underwent a reduced intensity transplant and a full intensity transplant, about 83 of them. The age of the patients, 
the median age was 51 in one trial, 44 in the other trial, but they've transplanted patients up to the age of 72 using donors, either sibling donors or unrelated donors. Just some more things we should look at. They really didn't stage these patients. We normally stage CTCL patients, so it's a bit hard to say what prior therapy they had or what disease they had going into transplant. But we do know what the time from diagnosis to transplant was, and that was about 36 months in one group of patients and about 20 months in the second group of patients. But the range may be as high as, high as 206 months. So some of these patients had their CTCL for over 10 to 15 years before undergoing transplant. So here are the outcomes, and if you remember what Dr. Porco was telling us about survival curves, I'm going to be showing you some survival curves uh, for the outcome. These are the patients transplanted, and this is their overall survival. So after five years, about 35% of them are still alive. And this is the amount of patients who died from transplant-related complications. So it's a fairly high transplant-related complication mortality rate, approximately 20%. So most of our studies doing transplant within the first year of undergoing transplant, approximately 20% of our patients die with some of the toxicities of the transplant. So it is a difficult procedure to get through. This next slide is what we call progression-free survival. And this is an important slide because this is following patients in the long term. And our progression-free survival in this study was 17% at, at five years. And if remember when we talked about uh, survival curves, if you have a plateau on this survival curve, which lasts a number of years, there's a suggestion in studies like this that this is curative therapy for at least 17% of these patients. So it perhaps has the potential for curing a number of patients with very advanced disease. There was no difference in progression-free survival based on the interval from diagnosis to transplant. So patients who are transplanted in the first year of diagnosis did about the same as patients who are transplanted after three years of undergoing therapy for CTCL. The relapse rate is fairly high. Uh, a number of patients obviously relapse with their underlying disease, 50% at one year and 61% at five years. Again, I think the importance of studies like these is this plateau on the survival curve, the progression-free survival cur curve, suggesting we are curing some of these patients. The next study I'm gonna show you is another study, a registry study from the European Registry Group. A smaller study, but it's important because it's a longer uh, uh, outcome data, so we've seen these patients now for a number of years. Again, a fairly small number of patients, 60 patients, almost evenly divided between MF and Cesare syndrome. The median age is 47. The time from diagnosis to transplant is 37 months. The number of lines of therapy prior to undergoing the transplant is four, with some of the patients having as high as 12 lines of therapy before going to transplant. They described 67% of their patients as having advanced disease, and that's how they just defined advanced disease. 47% were chemorefractory patients. So these are some, some more curves in how they did. So the non-relapse mortality, how many patients died with transplant, is around 20%. Within the first year, again, you see they, there's a lot of deaths in the first year from, from the transplant-related complications. And this is the relapse rate, about 40 to 50%, very similar to the previous trial I showed you from the CIBMTR. Now this is the survival rate and the relapse-free survival. Uh, this is with a median follow-up of about three years. These patients seem to be doing fairly well with about a 30 to 40% relapse-free survival rate, even a little bit higher, suggesting with the plateau that these patients may be cured of their underlying disease. Now they did a follow-up study with more follow-up. This is a median follow-up now of seven years. The disease-free survival is about 30% now at seven years. So these are the patients who've all, who are alive without the disease. Now some of them out eight, over eight or nine years post-transplant with no evidence of their disease coming back. The relapse rate was 45%, similar to the previous study I showed you. What's interesting though is 27 patients relapsed a medium of 3.8 years post-transplant. And eight of them now remain alive, a median of eight years post-transplant, using immunologic therapies to accelerate some anti-tumor effect of their donor cells. So we can salvage some of the patients who even relapse after a transplant with some additional immunologic therapy. So one of the themes, I think, is that immunologic therapy is an important way to cure patients of CTCL. One of the ways to deliver that is through a bone marrow transplant. And just one final study. Uh, this is the largest single center trial done for, for CTCL patients out of MD Anderson. 
a small number of patients. However, they all received a unique preparative regimen used in total skin electron beam radiation, which as you've just heard is often a, a treatment modality used for early stage CTCL. The median age was 50, the time from diagnosis to transplant was 48 months, 14 patients had stage four disease. So we don't have long-term follow-up, but at two years, the overall survival was 79%. Progression-free survival was 53%. They haven't updated the data on the study, but it'd be interesting to see how these patients do in the long term. So just in general, have we improved the outcomes of transplantation? Is it easier for our patients to go through transplant? It's a bit difficult to show that for CTCL patients because there's not enough patients who've undergone transplant for CTCL. However, I can show you in other diseases we have improved the outcome. And let me just show you some of the studies. What this showed is that is the uh, outcome of unrelated transplants, which are, are more difficult transplant over time. And this is a one-year survival. In the early and late 1990s, the one-year survival was 40%. Right now, the one-year survival is 60%. So in 20 years, we've increased the survival by 20% of patients going un undergoing unrelated transplants, our most difficult transplant. One of the reasons we're doing this is shown here in data from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. And this is the mortality of transplant in patients in the early years of transplants compared to more recent years of transplant. We've decreased the mortality, the early mortality, by day 100 to 200 by at least 50%. So we're doing a much better job of decreasing some of the toxicities of the transplant. And that's due to improvements in supportive care. We have better HLA typing. We have less severe graft versus host disease. We're using reduced intensity transplants, all of which is improving the outcome of our patients undergoing transplant. I think the real difficult question is what's the timing for transplantation of patients with CTCL? There are truly no formal recommendations as to when to proceed to transplant. This is a very indolent disease. Patients li can live with this disease for 20, 30, and 40 years. We're not going to be transplanting patients with that type of disease. What well, we are transplanting are patients with very aggressive disease, high stage disease, and disease that's not responding well to conventional therapy for CTCL. If you look at all of some of the studies, uh, the patients moving to transplant generally have advanced stage disease, stage three or four. They have some evidence of some large cell transformation. They've had the disease for three to five years and at least fail four lines of therapy. If we look at some of the other indolent diseases we transplant, such as follicular lymphoma, MDS, which sometimes can have a very chronic disease status, when, when, when their physicians tell them that with best treatment available, your overall survival is less than three to four years. That's when transplant can be considered or should be considered. So if we use that example for CTCL, once your median survival is down to three or four years, that's probably the time you start thinking about transplant to try to give you a better chance of longer term survival. Just in terms of the age of patients we undergo transplant with, we transplant patients now routinely up to the age of 75 if they're fit patients. So if they have good lungs, good heart, good liver, we can transplant them. Certainly there are some patients who are 50 we can't transplant because they're in poor shape, but generally a patient 75 year old who is in good shape can do as well as a patient who's 50 years old. Obviously this is important in a disease like CTCL where the median age is 60 to 70 years of age in patients who get this disease. Although donors is a problem, our donor pool now includes siblings, unrelated donors, cord blood, and actually haploidentical transplants can be used for this disease. So we think we've overcome some of the donor issues for transplantation. So just in summary, I, I think stem cell transplantation is an important treatment modality in CTCL. There are a small percentage of patients with very advanced disease who failed a lot of therapy who probably should be considered for transplant. I think the evidence that we have patients now eight and nine years post-transplant without relapse suggests we are cu curing a few number of these patients. And I think this cure is coming through an immunologic activity of the donor cells against the patient's own tumor cells. I think we've shown decreases in transplant-related toxicity, and that should be encouraging to patients who may need this therapy for their underlying disease. And I'm gonna stop right there. And, and thank you very much.